just going to see a very small paragraph today in the Kuzari, page 289. <laughs> paragraph 21 in the third essay, section 11, subparagraph 21. We were talking about the necessity for a healthy religious person. In other words, when I say a healthy religious person, a person who wishes to observe religion in a healthy fashion. A lot of psychological issues manifest themselves in the way that people practice religion. Would you agree? Yes. Would you agree that some people with OCD yes. use religion in certain ways with obsessive compulsive disorder? Would you agree that sometimes people who have anger management problems may tend to use religion to channel their anger and ire at others by, let's say, telling them off about something that they're doing wrong? Would you agree that perhaps people who hallucinate may use religion to proclaim that they are the Messiah? Right? So obviously there are many, many uh, psychological issues that can manifest themselves when people mix their imbalances with religion. And so therefore, by definition, a pious person is mentally well-balanced. And part of that mental balance also requires sort of a balancing act between seriousness, or what we would call fear of Hashem, Yiras Hashem, and joy and love in the service of whatever I'm doing. It requires both a very positive and optimistic and upbeat kind of attitude, but also tempered by a certain seriousness and a lack of lightheadedness and frivolity. So balance, it's all about balance. Now, everyone is unique, and therefore you can't say that everyone can maintain the balance the same way. But it's at least necessary for me to look inward and to try and find, okay, what am I, why, why am I gravitating to, towards certain types of religious practice and moving away from other types of religious practice? What does that say about me more than what does it say about Judaism or about the, you know, what does it say about my community? If our, we as a community are emphasizing certain things and de-emphasizing certain things. You know, there are certain Jewish communities where there's a tremendous emphasis on not talking during tefillah. There's another type of community which emphasizes the importance of social interaction even during tefillah. <laughs> Now, both of those, I suppose, you know, there's virtue to not talking during tefillah, but there may be people who are socially awkward and therefore use that as an excuse to not have any social intercourse. But the opposite, the other extreme, is, is actually quite negative, you know. If the whole thing I do from beginning to end when I come to shul is socially interchange, with the people around me and I'm not engaged in prayer at all or very minimally engaged in prayer like I just daven it up real quick so that I can resume my conversation so then that also says something it's all about balance right it's all about balance so the idea of balancing joy and fear is really what we're called upon to do and the reason why Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is so beloved in so many circles of generations of religious thinkers that come after him is because so many other texts that are written during his time really fixate on the sobriety and the awe that a person is supposed to have and don't focus enough on joy. Now, a lot of times... Jewish texts are a product of the time in which they are written. 
when Jews were persecuted and there were pogroms, there was very little to rejoice over. Okay, they just killed all of my livestock. My son was conscripted into the army. But let's be joyous anyway. Well, not, not so easy. So let's focus, therefore, on the alternative. Whatever's left in a joyless life is to focus on the fear of Hashem and belief and that tomorrow will be, you know, that Hashem will always watch over us, but that we have to fear Him even more. Did you notice that in earlier generations, perhaps some people, communities still do it, that if there's some calamity or a series of calamities that happen in the community, what do they tell everyone to do? We have to do tshuva, and it's probably the women's fault because they're not dressing sneas enough. I don't know why. I didn't, that's not my idea, so don't throw tomatoes at me. But somebody, some rabbi came up with the idea that if there's something wrong that happens in a community, there's a lack of sneers. So I'm thinking to myself, what's going through that rabbi's head who came up with that idea? What's, what kind of schmutz is he thinking about that he feels that we've got to clamp down on sneers? Right? In other words, we tend to fixate on the things that our minds gravitate to. And our religious minds gravitate towards those things which psychologically we're fixated upon. Right? Okay, so that's the balance that we're talking about. And so Rabbi Yehuda Halevi writes, if one is devoid of joy, then one's enthusiasm, and, and we're just going to focus on this short paragraph today. There are two points that he makes in this short paragraph then one's enthusiasm while performing the command of you shall surely rebuke your friend, or while debating an issue with someone, let's say you're in the base medrash and you're arguing a fine point in Gemara or Rashi or Taisvis, will be converted into anger and malice instead of a genuine act of piety. That's the first point he makes. And then the second point he makes is, this, this lack of joy, this joylessness, would also prevent his soul from being purified during prayer. So there are two points that he's making here. Number one, if you have joylessness in your life, if you don't have, if you're not a happy person, so then there are certain mitzvahs which require happiness and love in order to be performed properly at all. A perfect example is any mitzvah which requires a certain level of aggressive behavior. There are times when we are called upon to be aggressive. If we see someone doing something wrong, we are called upon to be proactive and to do an intervention. We believe in interventions today in society. If I see someone acting self-destructively and they don't seem to be able to pull themselves out of it by themselves, we say, let's do an intervention. If the guy's addicted to drugs or whatever it is, we've got to do an intervention. Well, the Torah invented the idea of an intervention. The Torah says, Hocheach tochiach es amisech. Thou shalt surely rebuke your brother or your fellow. Do an intervention. If you see someone behaving incorrectly, it's your obligation. You have to help that person. Help them. But if I'm not happy, and I'm not filled with love in my life, and I still feel a need to go and correct that person, then my motivations clearly are not for the sake of the mitzvah. Because if the whole purpose of the mitzvah is intervene so that you can help that person, but I'm not filled with love for that person, so then why do I find myself aggressively going over to him and telling him what he should and shouldn't do? It's only because I'm filled with resentment and anger and I need, a, I need an outlet. So my outlet is yelling at that guy, telling him, stop talking during davening. It's not because I love him and I care about him and I want him to have a good davening. It's because I am so annoyed with life. And that annoyance has been exacerbated by the fact that he's yapping behind me. So I'm going to take it out on him. So that's precisely what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says. And the same thing is true, there's a mitzvah to debate Torah with your chavrusa. The Gemara says, Oznid bru yirei Hashem, ish el ehu, that in the Beis Medrash there's this, the Pasuk says, there's this kind of volatile 
dialogue that takes place between two Talmidei Chachamim. But at the end, they have to part as friends. If in the course of the argument, one person has become so violent in his argument, clearly he's got issues. Whoa, take a step back. And so there has to be joy and love in life. Otherwise, you can't even engage in those exercises that call upon us to be aggressive and to be interventive. This is the Gemara. The Gemara actually states this, and you have this Gemara. I actually photocopied it in English so that we could save ourselves a little time. It's a Gemara in Erechin, page 16b, and it states, Our rabbis taught, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. One might have believed that one may only not smite him, slap him, curse him. Maybe that's the only thing that I'm not allowed to do. But therefore, Scripture states, in your heart, Scripture speaks of hatred in the heart. From where do we know that if a man sees something unseemly in his neighbor, he is obliged to reprove him, to rebuke him? Because it says, Hocheach tochiach, thou shalt surely rebuke. If he rebuked him and he did not accept it, from where do we know that he must rebuke him again? The text states, surely rebuke, hocheach tochiach, always. One might assume this to be obligatory, even though his face blanched, which means what if in the course of rebuking him, I cause his face to turn white because I've embarrassed him, because I've overdone it, because instead of speaking to him with words of love, I just take all of the, the life out of him because I've, become, I've been so harsh to him. Therefore, the text states, the lo sisa a love chait. You shall surely rebuke your fellow, but do not bear sin because of him. What that means is that if in the course of rebuking someone, I make him feel terrible for whatever reason, because of based on the way I said it, so then I haven't even done the mitzvah. It was taught in a b'risa that Rabbi Tarfun said, and this is a very important line, I wonder whether there is anyone in this generation who accepts reproof. For if one says to him, remove the moat from between your eyes, the moat like a little splinter from between your eyes, he would answer, remove the beam from between your eyes. So the first statement is, it's very hard to rebuke people in today's world, which he's saying in the times of the Gemara, how much more so in today's world, because people say, oh, you think I'm bad, look at you. Has that ever happened to you? You try to tell off someone very gently and kindly, and they say, well, who are you to tell me off? Look at what you do. Happens to me all the time, right? <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Okay. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Rabbi Lazar ben Azariya said, I wonder if there is anyone in this generation who knows how to rebuke. Just the opposite. I think that it's so difficult to fulfill this mitzvah properly because the Torah says do not bear sin in the course of rebuking that it's virtually impossible to find anyone with that level of sensitivity and balance. And then finally, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri said, I call heaven and earth to witness for myself that often Akiva was punished because of me, because I used to complain against him before our rabban, Rabban Gamliel. And all the more, and, but, but as a result of my getting Rabbi Akiva in trouble, he would always shower more love upon me. To make true what has been said, reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Reprove a wise man, and he will love thee. So it requires both parties have to be filled with a sense of love and joy and self-esteem and confidence. I love you, my brother, but I got to tell you, I think you made a mistake. And he accepts it, and he says, wow, you, you took the time to, out of your busy day, to make a point of correcting me because you care about me? I love you for that. That's healthy. That's healthy. And how often do we see that healthy behavior? Very rarely, right? So that's the exercise of the Gemara. Yes? But the Torah, the Rebbeim say, you know, you really you should only rebuke someone who you know is going to take or hear the, the advice. Precisely. Don't waste your time with someone you know is not going to hear it. You should not. It's, you, that's why we say chacham enav birosho. 
A wise man has his eyes in his head. Or Ezehu chacham haro'e et anolad. Who is wise? He who sees the outcome of his behavior. That's what it says in Pirkei Avos. Assess the person. You know, first assess yourself. That's the first thing you have to do. Why do I want to go over this person and tell them off? Is it because I really care about them? And if the answer is honestly no, it just annoys me what that person did, so then it is usser for you to rebuke that person. Usser. Because you're not going to fulfill the mitzvah, you'll only do an Avera instead. But if your objective is, I really do care about that person, I care about, I care about every Jew, and I care about that we should be, all be serving Hashem together the right way, let me go over to that person in a loving fashion and say to them, I think you made a mistake. Then the next question is, will they listen to me? How well do I know this person? How receptive will that person be to my gentle words of critique? And if you're going to answer, if the answer to either of those questions is it's not going to work, then don't do it. Don't do it. Now, this doesn't just apply to the people that we meet on the street or in shul or for coffee, but it applies to members of our family as well. I've learned so much from my wife about how to re properly rebuke someone. She never tells me I messed up, but she manages somehow to make me understand that I've messed up without telling me that I've messed up. And she's like amazing about it. I'm not, I'm not even, I haven't figured out how she does it, but she manages to do it. Like, you know, when it comes to various different things that I, that I don't do well, whether it's with the kids or the house or, you know, various things, I don't know, she's just got a talent. And she's like, I don't know, some, I think for some people it comes more naturally than to other people. But it's something that we can all work on something that we can all try to exercise, our spouses, right? How often do we get into fights because we try to correct what the other one is doing? But you can avoid all of the confrontation, if it's not a confrontation, but they understand that you're saying it out of love. Okay? And often it is out of love, but it just comes out the wrong way, because why? Because we're upset about something completely different that has nothing to do with our spouse, but they just happen to be the most convenient target at the moment that we're speaking to. Yes, and the same thing with our children. We, how often do we take out our daily anxieties and aggravations on the people that we love? So we have to be very, very careful. If we're not filled with joy in the moment, then silence is the best option. Let's wait till we calm down and are filled with a sense of love for ourselves, for life, and for the person we're about to speak to, and then we can talk to them. So that's as it pertains to the mitzvah of rebuke. Yes? How does that apply to children? I mean, uh, especially younger children, they're rarely receptive to any kind of criticism, right? So does this apply in the parenting realm, specifically with small children at all, or? It, absolutely, it applies to children of any age. So should we not bother if we know they're not going to be receptive? <laughs> no, no, because our role is to focus our children on receptivity. In other words, we know our children are not going to want to listen to us, but at a certain age, our job is, is to train them how to be receptive. That's part of the role of parenting. Right. So it's slightly different. Yeah. Not that you back off because you know they're not going to want to hear. Correct. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah. Although... Who knows what modern parenting would tell you, but but that would not that would be a shirking of one's and duty. Rabbi, what if it's the other way around, where the children who are of age and know better are abusive to the parents? I get that a lot. Well, we have, that's it's, that only compounds the the offense. And I just go silent, and then when I go silent, they can't stand it. Well, probably. <laughs> That's probably the best approach is to be oh, silent so. because you're giving, you're sending them the message and they'll learn for the future. That's how you can train them. That's how you can teach them how to, how to speak. The next part is it also prevents a person's soul from being purified during prayer. And this is such an important principle, which really Rebbe Yehuda Halevi had alluded to before 
that the pious person looks forward to the three times a day that he can daven, because those are days of great serenity and a sense of peace of mind and joy that he can restore his life to. So if a person is not feeling joyous during the times of prayer, the prayer will, have, will not meet its mark. You need to actually put yourself in a position of joy before you begin praying. And this is actually brought out in the Gemara itself. First of all, we'll skip number two because of time constraints. The Gemara says in source number three, Maseches Brachos, Tanu Rabbanan, Ein omdim lihispaleh lo mitochat zvut velo mitochat slut. Person may not begin praying. This is referring to Shmon Esrei. Neither out of sadness nor out of a sense of sloth or laziness. Velo mitoch schok nor out of out of silliness or jocularity. Velo mitoch sicha nor from schmoozing. Velo mitoch kalososh or lightheadedness. Velo mitoch dvarim betelim nor out of nonsensical things. Ela mitoch simcha shel mitzvah. What does simcha shel mitzvah mean? It means I have focused joy on the service of Hashem. That's the way Rashi explains. So, for example, the reason why right before we daven Shmon Esrei, we say the blessing of Ga'al Yisrael, is because it reminds us of why we should be so happy and grateful in life. Look at historically the, where we as the Jewish people come from. Hashem redeemed us from Egypt, split the Red Sea for us, did all of these amazing things, and look where we are today. That's the reason why the Gemara says you, there, be, there may be no interruption between the bracha of Ga'al Yisrael, God who has redeemed Israel, and the Shmon Ezra. We've got to stay focused on there's so much to be happy about in life, so much to be grateful for in life, and only then can we start saying Shmon Ezra. And Rashi also says that's the reason why we say Pesukei de Zimra, Ashrei, and all of the halalukas, all of the psalms that we say in the earlier part of the davening, is to put ourselves in that joyous attitude of life is amazing. And where do I see most that life is amazing? When I read the Tehillim. You know, David HaMelech was a very multifaceted person, very complicated person. But one thing we do know is that when he was upset, he was able to pour out his heart in upset. And when he was happy, he had this great talent of being able to express his joy. And so we read those Tehillim, we read those Psalms in order to be able to relate to David's joy and, and transfer that joy to ourselves. He was really genuinely happy about being alive and about being a servant of God. And that's why we read Psuke de Zimra before we start davening. How many of us, unfortunately, are joyless when we say Psuke de Zimra? And I count myself sometimes, I mean, I'm just exhausted. I'm up so early in the morning, I got to teach Dafyomi or just go straight to Minyan, depending on the day. And I'm half asleep when I'm saying Psuke de Zimra. And everyone else is just rubbing their eyes there because we've just woken up and we got to quickly run out to work because otherwise we're going to get caught in traffic. All of this anxiety <laughs> builds up during davening. Where's the joy? So if we behave that way, then we're missing the whole point. We're missing the whole point. And sometimes there's a part of me that says, you know, don't daven as much. Just say the words with a little bit more kavana. But that's not the prevailing attitude today. The prevailing attitude is get in as many words as you can in the shortest amount of time, and that's the way you succeed in davening. Unfortunately, it's not meant to be that way. Okay. So, um, and there's so much more to say about this subject, but I want us to go on to the next... But you should know that the Medrash also says the very same idea when it comes to prophecy. In source number four, the Alkut writes, Melameid she'ena shechina shora lo mitoch sicha u'dvarim b'teilim, ela mitoch simcha shel mitzvah. That joy, or I'm sorry, the shechina cannot rest on a person. Here we're talking about prophecy, to be able to have that divine spirit rest upon you. It can't be because of idle conversation, silly discussions, but it can only become from a focus simcha on being alive and being Hashem's servant. Shenamar, how do we know this? 
because before Elisha was able to have a prophecy, he said, He said, get me a minstrel and play some music for me. The very same language of putting oneself in a joyous attitude that is used for saying the words of Tehillim in Ga'al Yisrael is used for Elisha summoning a minstrel to play music before he could have a prophetic experience. I don't know about you, but music is a very, very important part of my life. And I think it should be part of, of an important part of everybody's life. We have such a gift today. It's called recorded music, right? How many of us squander that tremendous gift to put ourselves in the good frame of mind by listening to some beautiful music? You know, there, and the studies have been done that, when you, that listening to music activates certain parts of the brain that just like go on fire when you're listening to, to different kinds of music. And they can put a person into, this, into a sense of being more receptive to divinity and to knowledge and to putting a person in a, in a calm frame of mind. I mean, obviously it depends on the music you're going to listen to. I mean, I don't, even though he's a Canadian, I don't recommend Drake, I mean, but, or Justin Bieber, but, um, but listen to some beautiful classical music once in a while and let, you know, let, a, let a, a sonata permeate your being so that you can enter into that state of mind of joy and gratitude to be alive. Okay, so obviously this has to be tempered with the idea of having a sense of awe when you're standing before Hashem. And that's that next paragraph. The commentaries deal with this issue. How can I have both awe and a sense of joy when I'm standing in prayer? And the answer is, is that the mind is capable of having both. It's an awesome experience knowing that I'm standing before Hashem, but it's also very, it's a very joy-filled experience because I know that I'm really alive right now. I'm really, I'm really fulfilling my purpose if I'm standing in front of God prepared to do His will and prepared to live a productive, meaningful day of living, starting it off with prayer. There can, should be no greater, a greater joy than that. And so, um, so that's something that we should all be thinking about. This beautiful uh, prayer that is at the end of this paragraph, the Yalkut Yosef, uh, Rav Yitzchak Yosef, um, the, the son of Rav Ovadji Yosef, he quotes a whole bunch of different sources over here. And he quotes one source that says that if a person in the, is in the middle of Shema Koleinu, or right in the Shmon Esrei, or if he's right before Yehilu Ratzon, before he takes his three steps back, and he finds himself, nafla belibo simcha, he finds himself all of a sudden happy, and he can't really identify why he's happy, he should say, yesh levakesh kach, yehi ratzon melefanecha, shezot ha'ahava tehei le'olam, kishura unetua belibi uvalev kol zari. That may be your will, Hashem, that this love and joy that I'm experiencing right now should always stay with me and with my children forever. Va'al yevakesh ela al ha'ahava uretzon Hashem. And your, your only desire is to constantly be in love with Hashem and to, to desire to do what Hashem wants you to do. <coughs> what a beautiful idea. What a beautiful concept. Something to aspire toward. Okay, Adkan and the Kuf.